right, boys and girls, thank you for joining me once again. Where people continue to be wrong on the interwebs, they continue to be recidivist defenders, they continue to be Chris from Plant Chompers, who has made a video in response to my criticism video regarding his episode on Professor Tim Noakes. So this confirms what we knew already, which is that Chris is in fact a coward and will not front up to a face to face discussion regarding any of the central tenets of the theses that are actually of importance here. Um, and he makes all kinds of excuses. We'll hear those in a minute when we go through his entire video, as is my general want here on my channel, to go through someone's entire video, a word for word, and deal with it point-wise. So we'll do that again today with Chris's video here. So instead of a discussion, which is what we should be having, we're playing he said, she said, schoolgirls again. Very much like the douchebag thing, only at a higher level, because Chris's while irritating in his own way, are much less irritating than, say, Greg Douchebag may well be considered to be by most. Um, anyway, let's deal with Chris's attempt to dismiss my uh, arguments made on my criticism of his video. Righto, righto. Chris, righto, Chris, let's I go. was busy making a new episode about Lisa Moscone, a neurologist who directs Cornell's Alzheimer's Prevention Program. It's what I love to do because my heroes are scientists who are actually doing science and making great scientific advances. Which that makes me one of your heroes, Chris, by definition. Sorry about that. She is doing in spades. Her program does MRI and PET scans so they can see what's up with the brains of people on different diets. She has a fascinating book I'm reviewing. Ted has done such a great job of attracting top neurologists like her. Sandrine Thure, 7 million views. Wendy Suzuki, 8.5 million views. So? Laura Boyd, 36 million. So? Faith in humanity restored, watching so many people watch real scientists like that. But all of a sudden, my channel lit up with information. So the inference is that because I don't have millions and millions of views, I am not a real scientist. Uh, which can be easily dismissed, Chris, by doing a simple search for me by name, whereupon you will find that I have been, in fact, a real scientist for more than 25 years. So there goes that argument. About me, I never knew. I've been exposed for spreading lies. I might also be a charlatan and scientifically illiterate. Good work, good work. Some of my supporters there bombing Chris's comments there to let him know that he's a charlatan and an ideologue. I don't think he's a liar, per se, although there are probably one or two things that he has been untruthful about, or at least selective in his filtering about. But I think that, you know, liar might be a bit strong, boys and girls. However, charlatan, absolutely. Dunning-Kruger sufferer of the highest order, without any question whatsoever, unequivocally. Um, and, and coward. Pretty clear. And being clueless, I got destroyed by a professor. I always want to take comments on my channel seriously and understand where they're coming from. I didn't see anything specific in these comments to tell me where I'm off base, but... Right, so specifics are important, are they, Chris, in a video? Good. Okay, keep that in mind, boys and girls. Specifics. If a professor is calling me out, that sounds important. I'd so much rather apologize and correct myself than... No, you wouldn't. What you'd rather do is make a response video wherein you actually subdiffuse um, misdirect, oh look over there, shiny thing, make excuses for not actually fronting up to a discussion whereupon you could apologise to your viewership for misleading them for so many years in such a criminally negligent and misanthropic manner, um, but instead that's not what you want to do at all. What you want to do is basically selectively filter the experience of truth to people once again in your ideologically based fashion and to stay wrong. The dumbest thing I could do is to stay wrong and harm my own health and everyone else who watches my channel. Agreed. Thanks for joining us. Next time, we'll deal with somebody else who's wrong on interwebs. Chris has finally woken up to himself, apparently. At least if he'd stopped his video at that point, uh, we might have got the, uh, the idea that he might have woken up to himself, but unfortunately, he keeps talking. So I decided to pause the brain episode and see what Professor K has to say. He's been a guest lately on some of the shows hosted by Carnivore Doctor YouTube stars, and those interviews are getting good traction. 
When I landed on his channel, I noticed some familiar faces like Stanford professor Christopher Gardner. Yes, that's the professor, the professor of nutrition who clearly does not understand basic biochemistry, as the title of my video there indicates. Folks should go and watch that video and see why it is I'm saying that. Why would I say such a thing about Christopher Gardner? I wonder. Check it out. I've listened to many of his lectures over the years, read his papers, and I'm enrolled in one of his nutrition courses. Well, then I'd ask for your money back, Frankie Chris. In that case? His latest paper, The Swap Meat Athlete Study, comparing performance of recreational athletes across three diets, is small. It's not only small, it's also reductionist in the extreme. It's also a mechanistic speculative paper rather than a cause and effect outcomes, a hard outcomes paper of any kind. It deals with a metabolite known as trimethylamine N-oxide, or TMAO, which is touted or purported to be some kind of problem for the health of humans who eat uh, a largely or entirely meat-based diet. Turns out it's not a problem at all. And if you look at the functioning holistically of the human metabolic system and the microbiome system, you'll see why that is. I've covered that previously on my fine, fine offerings on various social media video hosting platforms. Over the years, perhaps you should check that video out and see why it is that the TMAO idea is false um, and, and TMAO is not something to worry about at all, at all whatsoever, perhaps, if you actually want to learn some actual science, Chris, instead of just reading selected papers by selected authors that you personally find to be credible in your untrained opinion on the matter. But it's very interesting. Bart's episode about me is 96 minutes long. Yeah, well, that's how wrong you were, Chris. That's how long it took to explain how wrong you were. It's about debunking the episode I had just done about Professor Tim Noakes. I watched all 96 minutes of it to see where Bart thinks I had gone wrong. Mm -hmm. You're probably interested in less time. So I'll just touch on the parts you're probably most... So you'll just selectively cherry pick the bits that you want to talk about and make some attempt to undercut me personally rather than dealing with the actual arguments that were put forward. I think you have actually dealt directly with only one or two of the things I actually said. And you're still in error, but we'll deal with that when you get to them. Most interested in about me and the topics we covered. I'll link his episode in the description for people who want more. First, am I doing this for the money? And you're an ideologue. See, the ideologue is not someone who's doing it for the money. I think I made a comment after that, suggesting that you might be doing what you're doing for money in some way. I didn't suggest it was by getting rich by being a YouTube promoter. Uh, or uh, creator of YouTube videos. I am one of those myself, Chris, as you know, and, and you and I both know that we don't get rich doing that. I'm suggesting that your money may well be coming from other sources. Who's here to make money there you go. and fleecing other stupid people of their money to support your little sing song. I am retired because I'm old and fortunately I don't need the money. I you don't need the money. Okay, well, why don't you give away the pittance that YouTube does pay you? If that's genuinely the only income you've got coming in from YouTube, why don't you give that away to somebody? Maybe you do, I don't know. You haven't said that you do here. I do this for fun and hopefully... Fun? God. Wow. Okay. ...to bring some good into the world. Well, in that case, you failed, Chris, because you're promoting an anti-humanist lifestyle an anti-humanist approach to nutrition, a dangerous contraindicated wrong approach to nutrition that will undercut the health of society at large in basically just about every way possible. And it also clearly patently, in, in my opinion, on my understandings of the readings I've done around climate science, which I believe is your area, it seems patent and clear to me that the production of plant-based food-like slop for human beings is causally associated with vastly more climate harm than regenerative beef production, for example, ever could be. But that's not really central to the tenets or the theses of what we're talking about with what is the appropriate diet for a human being? Because we biologically 
have an ideal diet. It's unequivocal what that diet is and why that is so. And the diet that you are promoting, Chris, is not it. It's about as far away from it as it's possible to get, in fact. I don't know how much Bart knows about plant chomper finances, but let's get the inside scoop from my accountant and auditor. <laughs> <laughs> my kids call me the Countess of Cash. At age 71, I still work full time at our family company, and that's my official title. Unfortunately for me, Chris is obsessive about plant chomper finances. He didn't want to run ads on his channel, but YouTube requires it, so he turns off all the options he can, like non-skippable ads and ads that interrupt his episodes in the middle. Mm -hmm. Don't get me started on how much money he loses buying so many books. Yeah, and books are not peer-reviewed sources of scientific literature, Chris. They will not inform you on cause and effect. What they will inform you on is the educated opinion the educated opinion of the author or authors of that or those books. Nothing else. Paying for access to talks from organizations like the American Diabetes Association. So why on earth would you pay a red cent to an organization such as that? An organization totally divorced from reality, science, or um, philanthropy towards human beings in any way, shape, or form. This is an organization underpinned solely and completely by its own bottom right hand corner with bought and paid for position statements, which are so called educated opinions, aren't they, Chris? Educated opinions, etc. He gets asked every week to promote some product and he turns them all down. People offer to yeah, I do that too. donate to support the channel. And he says, no, thanks. You don't want to know how much money he loses on this. I wish I didn't know. This is what YouTube said I earned from the Tim Noakes episode during its first week. Right. There you go. Okay. So $75, $74.86. Um, gained a couple of subscribers, about 71. That's good going. Uh, got 2.7 thousand hours of watch time, which is about the same as usual for his videos, apparently. Um, and it got about 14,300 views in the first week. All right, let's have a look, shall we, at my video, which responds to his video, taking into consideration the vastly smaller subscriber base that I, in fact, have. Here is my video for the first nine days. And it's got 6.9 thousand views, the same 2.7 thousand hours of watch time, give or take. Uh, a more modest increase in my subscriber base of seven and $57.08. So I'm absolutely creaming it. Absolutely creaming it from YouTube. So I am. Um, hmm, perhaps maybe the income streams are coming from other places. Must be. Otherwise, this couldn't be my full-time occupation. I'm not uh, retired in the same way that you are, Chris. I'm retired from academia, absolutely, but I still have to earn a living at this stage. I, I don't have my finances at my young, tender age uh, to a stage where I can rely upon investments or whatever else. I still have to earn a weekly wage every week, and so I do that as a self-employed a social media influencer through various streams of income, some of which you'll probably touch on in this video, it seems. All right, so anyway, that's, uh, that's what's going on with that. Uh, the reason for showing you that, the reason for showing you that, boys and girls, is because Chris now wants to turn around and suggest it's me that's creaming it. <laughs> dear, oh dear, no. $75. But I spent considerably more than that because I bought his books and some papers I used in the episode. Perhaps, though, Chris, you could bring yourself up to speed with some of the methodologies that are available to circumvent those paywalls. I know. Bart said I didn't need to. Oh, yeah. look. One of the very many papers I have published in my publishing career is an actual science doer. Someone actually doing the science, Chris. This particular one's in the area of physiology, but I have publications in four separate fields of specialization over an entire publishing career up to date um anyway thanks for uh, thanks for highlighting one of my very early papers i think that one's from about 2000 and 
one or something somewhere in there anyway whatever yes i've known about sci-hub forever i also pay for stock footage and photos i use and yes i know about creative commons too it usually takes me three weeks to produce an episode because of all the research and also trying to figure out how to display the data in a way that's simple and vid- That's uh, gobbledygook speak for it takes me a long time to work out how to twist the truth to suit my ideology and to cherry pick the things I want to cherry pick and to leave out important details um, again in order to subserve nothing really than my want to propagandize people to this ludicrous lifestyle video form but what if someone like bart were able to turn those into longer episodes and publish one every day or two like he's doing he t- uh, well yes when i'm in my full working capacity throughout the vast majority of the year i do publish very often during the week it seems to be one of the tools available to a creator to enable the maintenance of any kind of momentum when you have a modest uh, subscriber base such that i do have uh you know i have a modest subscriber base of around thirty thousand, chris so i do need to keep poking the thing with a stick to keep it rolling turn mine into 96 minutes adding 72 minutes of monetizable content if you then yes which i made 50 something dollars off good at YouTube run both skippable and non-skippable ads throughout the episode, you get this. Let's do that. Trying to find a Medicare plan can be confusing. You mean the 22 countries study? What is being a human? Yeah, so the point that Chris is making is that my videos have ads on them. Yes, they do. Absolutely. That's how I made 50 something dollars from this video in nine days, I think it was. Absolutely creaming it, Chris. You're right. You got me. Sometimes it's choosing playtime. Which is less than what you made on your video. Despite the exact same watch time. Isn't that interesting? Over prep time. Or skipping the grocery store to do something you love. Between LDLC so-called and anything else. Every layer of this murder has revealed another layer. That seems like a sweet gig compared to my... Yeah, $54, was it? I can't even remember now. $50-something dollars in nine days for that video, Chris. You're right. Financial disaster of a YouTube channel. Thank goodness I'm retired and please nobody tell Tony. But a new episode every day doesn't give Bart much time to fact check the career scientist he's debunking. He... I myself am a career scientist, Chris, and I do fact check what I say very carefully before I say it. So your comment here or your inference to the contrary is false. He also has a Patreon page, which I don't have any. So that's one of my other income streams. Because if you want to rely on YouTube to make a living, Chris, well, you and I both know how that goes. He's had a side hustle selling a vegan dietary supplement. Well, it says appropriate for vegans on the label because it does not contain animal products, Chris. It's not vegan per se, though, because the base ingredient or the base source of the active ingredient in the main flagship product of this company is a cyanobacter, not a plant. It's a cyanobacter. It's a whole... Um, phylum of creature slash plant because it's neither really a plant nor a creature actually it's bacterial but it has photosynthetic ability so where do we put that is that vegan is that not vegan apparently according to the powers that be that decide what's vegan and what's not it's appropriate for vegans but it certainly isn't promoted as a vegan thing It's a nutraceutical that has a specific nutraceutical effect on the human body. It's while it does also claim one or two nutritional things in it or nutritionally useful things in it, um, and it and it has to be defined according to FDA rules as a nutritional supplement. It's really a nutraceutical. There's very little nutrition value in the thing at all. The, The nutraceutical value, though, is massive, and I've covered. Um, 
what that nutraceutical value is in some depth on my actually science-based channel if people want to go and check that out basically it's a bit of a dead giveaway at the at the top of that little label there on the side of my van door there geez that van needs a wash doesn't it uh and but basically what it is it's, is it encourages your adult stem cell system to release adult stem cells into your bloodstream whereupon they do magics check it out uh, and all the supporting videos i've made about it at previous times right Good. So that's the income streams, really. Um, the only one you haven't spoken about, Chris, although it is kind of covered under the Patreon membership thing, is that I also consult with folks one on one who want to get a scientifically experienced, dispassionate second or third opinion on various things I've been told by various peoples at various times, or they just want some reassurance that the carnivorous diet is indeed appropriate, sustainable, and health promoting for human beings, um, or they want some um, input from me on how I might approach any given situation health-wise. Um, so they're the three income streams, really. And of the three income streams to speak of there, the YouTube income is vastly, vastly the smallest. Okay? so. Um, we seem to be spending a lot of time on this, Chris, and you haven't actually dealt with any of the actual arguments I've had to make in any way. That he has taken for a very long time. Here he is. It's about 13 years now, I think. There is a product, maybe 14, which is derived from a blue-green cyanobacter that grows in this one particular lake, December of 2010. Of course, when I started taking the product, there you go. Um, 12 years. <laughs> okay. The product changed hands for the new company and I decided to come on board and become a, a marketer of the product in my own right. I'm taking four capsules once a day. It made me curious about where he's a professor because most universities... See, there's a fundamental miscomprehension, misunderstanding, Chris, of what a professor is. A professor is someone who holds the rank of professor in academia. It is not a job description. You are not often parsimoniously people will just will say, you know, when they say what do you do for a living to a professor, that that person will often say, I'm a professor at such and such a university. What they're saying is that is my rank in academia and I am currently employed as a lecturer or as a researcher or as a lecturing researcher, depending on the agreement with that organization in that individual academic's case, or as a consulting researching academic, whatever. Okay. Um, the job description is generally lecturer or researcher. Professor is a rank in the same way that senior lecturer or senior researcher is a rank, not a job description. So to, to say, where are you a professor is a fundamental misunderstanding of what a professor is. Strictly speaking, Chris, what I am is a professor emeritus or emeritus, depending where you come from in the world. The word emeritus or emeritus just means retired from working in academia, as in retired from being employed by an academic institution of any kind. The rank of professor remains intact for life, unless it's revoked for some reason, like misconduct, and mine hasn't been, so I am a professor of health science. Okay? Simple. What's next? These would want their faculty devoting time to doing science yeah, but you're assuming that because I describe myself as a professor, and quite rightly so, that I am currently employed by an academic institution. I'm not. I'm employed by me. I get up in the morning and I look in the mirror before having a shave, and I go, good morning, boss. And I often say, what are you wasting time in front of this mirror for? Go and do some work, son. To which I say, sir, yes, sir. And I crack on. Okay? publishing papers and teaching. I could find that he was once a lecturer. I was once a senior lecturer at the School of Allied Health Sciences at De Montfort University. That's one of 
nine quality uh, academic institutions that I have worked at over a roughly 25-year academic career over the years. See how, see how it says I'm an expert up there too, by the way, Chris, in cardiology? See that? That's interesting, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yep, so I, you're right. I did once work at that particular, that, that's, a, that's a university in Leicester in the United Kingdom. That's where that is for people that might want to know. It's in Leicester. Leicestershire. Leicestershire. Whatever. Um, I was there for three years. And I finished as a senior lecturer there. Don't know why it says lecturer and hasn't been updated. Maybe I should write to them and say, actually, you should update me now to Professor Emeritus. And you should probably make a note there on your little page that I'm no longer employed by De Montfort University. No? Okay, what's next? Sir, not a professor at Montfort. That's right, I was not, and it's De Montfort. I was not a professor there at that time, no. My promotion to the rank of academic, uh, the academic rank of professor came after my time at De Montfort. And he had WinTech in his Twitter bio once. That's the school that I did my undergraduate training at. That was the first, um, the first university that I attended as a student, Chris. Fairfield another time. but Fairfield College was the high school I went to. College in New Zealand doesn't mean university. College can mean high school. That was, that was my um, age 13 to 17 schooling was Fairfield College. Okay. Neither has a record of him that I could find. Well, why would they? Do you understand New Zealand privacy laws? Clearly not. Perhaps you should look up New Zealand privacy laws. And you'll see why it is that such institutions don't have records that you can find about people, especially after they are no longer associated with that organization. They would need my permission to tell you anything. Okay, that's the law here in New Zealand. But I did watch this interview where he explains why he isn't a professor. No, I didn't explain why I'm not a professor at all. Because I am a professor. And in fact, the video that you're about to show was made before I was a professor. At that time, I was a senior lecturer. Emeritus. When you are appointed as an academic, obviously before that you will go for a job interview and the panel will ask you a bunch of questions and uh, one of the classic questions... I think this video is nearly five years ago, maybe from memory. My ascension to the academic rank of professor is relatively recent. There you go, there's some more information for you. Questions that they ask just about invariably is what separates you from every other academic that we're going to be interviewing for this job? To which I've always proudly got up on my hind legs and said, I will never stand up in front of a paying crowd of students and espouse fallacious dogma. You know, you would have had to lecture to people, uh, you know, have X amount of plant matter in your diets, you know, be it broccoli or greens or something, because you need to get X, Y, and Z vitamin or mineral out of it. But you, I mean, even with all that knowledge, you, you're still happy to go, no, I don't need it. It's, it's not necessary. Sorry. Within, you know, a few weeks, you get a knock on your office door and the senior dean comes in and says, now listen, we need to have a chat about what you've been saying to students in class. And I'm like, you know, are you out of your mind? You know, three or four weeks ago, you interviewed me. I told you what I was going to do. I'm now doing it. I'm legally entitled to do it. And now you're telling me to not do it. And then that starts a whole process of bullying, harassment, all these different processes. That yeah, so in other words, basically what happens is these institutions will try to railroad, lambast, bully and harass academics into saying, espousing, if you like, the accepted narrative on given topics. Unfortunately, in every civilized Western nation in the world, academic freedom is enshrined in law. 
basically what it says is variations around the world on the theme of an academic is free to hold and espouse any opinion that he, she, shim, him, or fee, fi, fo, fum should see fit for any reason, without explanation, whether that is popular or otherwise. It's academic free speech. It's absolutely enshrined in legislation. And as such, if you get interviewed for an academic job and you say the difference between me and everybody else is I'm going to get up and tell students the truth, and I will not be pushed into saying things that are untrue to students, and they give you that job, they now have no legs to stand on, except making your life there very unpleasant for the next several years until you go, you know what, I'm going to apply for another, a, a different job somewhere else. That's why over 25 years or so, I changed employer um, eight or nine times. Pretty simple, really. Doesn't mean I'm not a professor. I still am, Chris. Whether you like that or not. Okay. But they start invoking and this and that and the other thing. And that basically is, at the end of the day, why I went, you know, this academic game is not for me. But I right, so at the end of 2018, I decided that it was no longer in my interest to attempt to be employed as a full-time employed member of academic staff at any academic institution and as such I decided that I would walk away from the place that I was employed at that time and to close the door on that part of my career and do different things and I've been concentrating on doing just that ever since. I am not aware of any university that wouldn't ask this question. I get people saying to me where is the evidence that your carnival diet is good for you? Okay, to which the answer is, of course, it does not yet exist in the literature. Of course, what I did not say at that time in that interview was that it does not exist for any diet or any aspect of any diet anywhere in the literature. There is no robust, valid, human nutrition science that can inform us on hard health outcomes over any period of time in human beings. None. It's not just the carnivore diet that suffers from that lack of robust science underpinning it. We don't yet have that science because we're just getting started down this track. But Bart did have something very important and valid to say about me and my episodes. This video is about stuff he knows nothing about in an area that he has no training in whatsoever, that being health, nutrition, physiology, anything basically relating to the stuff that I absolutely am actually an expert in. I try to make it plain in my episodes as I did right up front in that episode that I am an earth scientist and my mission with Plant Chompers is to identify with the vast majority of people who are trying to figure out who to listen to. Yeah, but... Chris, you're doing that by selectively cherry-picking information, leaving out other information to suit yourself, despite the fact that that information undercuts your position, giving a fallacious view of what science is, what it isn't, what it's capable of informing on and what it's not, and presenting yourself as a credible referee on science when you're anything but. You're an ideologue and a buffoon. Sorry about that. Just facts. The dilemma we all face, though, is there are university scientists whose ideas completely oppose each other. How do mere mortals like us make sense of that? I started that episode having just walked out of an earth science talk relating to food systems. I am at MIT's Media Lab today because I just gave a TEDx talk to a packed audience. The beard was to represent our forest because we've converted all... How does this add to your video in any way, Chris? All of this, which was relevant at the time to your video about Tim Noakes, is still irrelevant, completely irrelevant, to anything I said about your video about Tim Noakes. In any way. Almost half of them globally to farmland. And that is driven primarily by the food we eat. Here's what Bart had to say about that. Yes. A lot of forest has been cut down to clear land for human food production purposes. 
Most of it, Chris, for monocropping, not for grazing. Did Bart just say I should stay out of nutrition and then rendered an opinion in a field he's not trained in without backing it uh, up? What I said was not an opinion, Chris. It was a fact. With evidence? Here's some evidence. That's not evidence of anything. That's his land use. Land use has nothing to do with land clearance. You might clear a land for a certain purpose and use it for that purpose for a short period of time and then change the use of that land to something else. Example, you might cut down millions and millions of hectares of rainforest in the Amazon in order to plant um, trees that you can get seed oils from, only to find that after several years, much of the nutrient in that soil is depleted by that monocropping um, procedure, and thus is no longer that land is no longer effective for that purpose, and it needs regenerating, and the best way to do that is to put stock on it. That will add nutrient back in and make it regenerative and that sort of thing, and that's what generally happens. That is the general life cycle of land that has been cleared. First of all, it's used for monocropping of some kind, and then it's used for other crops that do okay with less nutrient, and then as sure as little green apples grow on little green apple trees, at some point we have to give up on that and put animals on it. Okay? It's a fact. So this is just misdirect. This is a lie, Chris. You know this is a lie. You must know this is a lie. That's a clever attempt to undercut a fact that I stated, irrespective of my expertise. This is information you can get if you actually read around the topic broadly and listen to everybody, instead of cherry-picking a position on the basis of what suits you ideologically. Okay? Sorry about that. Facts again. What's next? I had just presented in my talk, for land use, there yes, is... use, not clearance. Nothing like cows, except maybe sheep, but we don't eat much of them anymore. This comes... Many. It's from very well-researched data from scientists at Oxford. And about land use, not about land clearance. The reason that the land was cleared in the first place, which is what I commented upon correctly. It shows that the elephant in the room is actually a cow. Chicken. Mm, no, it's not a cow. And pork and fish use a fraction of land cows do, and plants are way below them. If you add crops, you see that their global agricultural footprint is less than half of pasture land. 43% of those crops are used to feed animals. Okay, so again, we are now ignoring completely the fact that most crop materials fed to animals are the parts of those plants that are not edible by humans. So humans grow a crop primarily to feed humans plant material, which they shouldn't do, but they do anyway. What's left, the stuff that can't be used by humans for food, is generally fed to animals like pigs. To encapture the proteins and fats in those plant materials that humans can't get and allow those animals to um, bring those proteins up to a, a standard that a human can indeed use. It's a good, it's a good use of resource, that is. And animals existing on the planet, they're going to have to be fed somehow. If they're left to roam free wherever they want, they have to find their own feed. If they're kept in larger numbers than they perhaps would naturally exist, perhaps, then the people keeping those animals at higher concentration or higher head numbers than might be the case naturally are responsible to feed them. So why not use? The leftovers from something that can't be used by people. There's nothing wrong with that, Chris. If you remove beef from the picture, global land use for agriculture drops in half. It's shocking. And if you remove... Yeah, because it takes quite a bit of space to keep a number of cows in good health and robustitude and have enough grass resources, etc. Um... I don't see the problem here. If we were to use vastly more land 
to keep regenerative grazing stock like cattle and sheep, how would that be a problem? If commensurate to that, we vastly reduce our intake of plant materials, which we absolutely should do because our genetic and evolutionary design is to be an obligate hypercarnivore and not to eat plant material in any significant amount whatsoever, what's the problem? This is you know, another complete misdirect subterfuge trying to undercut something I've said by talking about something I haven't spoken about. I did not mention land use. Chris made a comment about the clearance of land, to which I made a completely correct statement about the reason why that land is cleared in the first instance. Because to graze animals, you don't particularly need to clear the land. I, I can look out the window right now and see several cows, two, who are currently grazing on grass, growing in and around the base of a tree. There are quite a few trees on this property, and the cows seem to do just fine. The land did not need clearing to put the cows there. Okay, you can't graze cows in a heavy forest situation because there's no grass. There is a limit to the amount of land that you can put cows on, yes. But we're nowhere near that because most of that land that you could put cows on is being used to grow crops that we don't need. Okay? Simples. If dairy, it drops in half again. Is it any wonder that 80% of the deforestation of the Amazon is thought to be for raising cattle? But it's not, though. That's false, Chris. The land use for cattle, yes, but the deforestation happens in the first instance, to grow palm oil trees, mostly, okay? And most of the remainder is to grow soy to feed pigs. Since the year 2000, we've converted tropical forest to farmland equivalent to the area of Ireland, the UK, Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, and Poland combined. That's bad. We could use land in a much better way than what we do. There's no argument from me that that is not so. It's also not central to the to the thesis at all about what is the appropriate diet for human beings. This is all subterfuge ideology. And while I might agree with some of what Chris says about the way that humans have an impact upon the planet that we live on, that doesn't change any of the facts around what is the appropriate diet for a human being, and that is hypercarnivore. Okay? And Chris's ridiculous attempt at slurring Professor Tim Noakes, which is what I was commenting on in my original video, my criticisms of Chris's ridiculous slurs, his steaming excremental pustulous hypocrisy, and his Dunning-Kruger and arrogance were entirely justified. Prove me wrong. I can't imagine a scientist in 2022 not knowing this and promoting an all-meat diet any more than I can imagine going back to burning coal in our homes to heat. The appropriate diet is a separate issue to environmental concern of any kind. What is the appropriate diet for a human being, any one given human being, based on the way we have developed over millennia genetically, organ systems-wise, everything about us as an organism, that is not impacted by the fact that there are X number of human beings on the planet behaving very badly in terms of environmental protection and all of that and sustainability, etc. They are separate issues. We can absolutely provide appropriate food for human beings, all of us, without destroying our planet. Unfortunately, currently, we are not doing that. Those are not the same issue. What's next? Eat them. But I know when speaking about nutrition, I have to back up everything with data from the best scientists who are actually... Yeah, but Chris, you're not competent to decide who are the best scientists in human nutrition because it's not your field. You don't know anything about this field. And as such, 
you're you're led to ridiculous conclusions like Christopher Gardner is a good source of information about human physiology because I've covered that in the video that we had a look at briefly earlier. He's not at all. Doing science and collecting data just... Yeah, I've been doing that for more than a quarter of a century. ...like I have to do in Earth science. That's why you often hear me in my episodes saying, hmm, that's above my pay grade. Maybe we should hear from a scientist like Roy... As a retired individual, Chris, everything is above your pay grade. Taylor, whose team has collected so much solid MRI data of ailing organs. And that's why my 20-minute episodes take three weeks to make. Chris that and because it takes you a long time to work out how to spin things. Basically, how to lie to people, Chris. He's been obsessed for 22 years with the science of nutrition studies. How is it possible then that your husband has learned nothing about nutrition science in that time? Other than because of his stunning arrogance in Dunning-Kruger and his inability to objectively look at actual science and understand his place in the hierarchy of scientists. That's the issue here. Sorry about that. Facts again. I noticed in the comments section on Bart's channel there were some specifics. One commenter said Bart caught me lying about my father. Mm, I know. Yeah, 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 yeah. That tendency, well, because when my father got heart disease, I always had to mow the lawn because he said it would strain his heart. It's hang on, hang on, hang on. Was that the same father that you were talking about earlier? So that's a question because I'm doing my critique of your video, Chris, on the fly in one take without having watched the thing through first necessarily from start to finish. So you spoke at one point about your father and at another point about your father-in-law, which is the part I missed. Apologies. Good point. However, does this impact the actual argument at hand here as to whether or not your ridiculous, unfounded slurs on Professor Tim Noakes were appropriate or not? And does it have any impact on what is the appropriate optimal diet for a human being, any given human being? The answer is no. This is not important. This is a waste of time. With the clear arteries, that one. How many fathers have you got, Chris? Here's what I actually said in that episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You said father and father-in-law. Okay, we get it. Fine. Apologies. Shall we move on and stop wasting time on this and talk about the actual point? Like my 93-year-old father-in-law who can eat anything and his LDL stays low and arteries clear. I can clear that up. It's my dad who's 93. And yes, we get it. We understand. Goodness me. Are your viewers that limited, that stupid that they need this spelt out? I missed the words in law on one occasion. It's not important. Has great arteries. Chris's dad died of a heart attack at 70 after years of eating the Atkins diet. How many years? And how do you know exactly what he ate? Do you have his nutritional intakes recorded by an independent observer because write this down people tell lies about what they eat all the time also what were his other habits outside of nutrition how was his exercise did he smoke did he drink what was his genetic predispositions no okay shall we move on then comment so that was just a ridiculous um appeal to emotion and a, an appeal to a, a a fallacy there to try and l causally link one factor out of a milieu of uncontrolled degrees of freedom as somehow the cause of an outcome. That's the whole point with nutrition science. It is impossible to do that. Okay? Roseanne Bart made a very fair point about me not always pointing out conflicts of interest. Yeah. So in this part of his video, he is commenting very, very briefly on a couple of papers by Stevens that Tim Noakes is citing. And his entire commentary on those papers is, I didn't know who this author was. Fine. I checked him out. 
And he had three funding sources, one of which was okay, in your opinion, Chris, and the other two were commercial food-based entities. And as such, you then just discarded both those papers and, and, and made it very, very clear that you don't take them remotely seriously because of conflict of interest. And then later in your same video, you put forward the European Consensus Panel opinion paper about LDL cholesterol, which doesn't even exist, and heart disease as proof of causality, which it isn't, a thing that has a conflict of interest statement that you would not believe. Go and look at my video where I'm dealing with Chris's video about Tim Noakes in the first instance a couple of weeks ago on my channel. It's called Plant Chompers Munched or something like that. Go and check it out. You, it will stun you. This is what I mean about Chris's steaming, stinking, pustulous, excremental hypocrisy. And now he's just going to gloss it over. Oh, yeah, well, I just decided not to do it. That point, Chris, absolutely destroyed your credibility. And you need to front up to that. You were absolutely eviscerated by me on this point alone. Absolutely eviscerated. And you should have the good sense and the good grace to now shut your channel down and withdraw from speaking publicly about these aspects forevermore. You are disqualified. If there's one thing that disqualifies you more immediately and more fully than anything else, it is hypocrisy, hypocrisy spin doctory, propaganda, and misanthropic disinformation like you're putting forward here. We are done. But let's hear the rest of your video, because that's what we do here. I did it with some papers Dr. Noakes was referencing. They're both. But inexplicably, I didn't when referencing a paper that refuted his... It's not inexplicable. It's because the conflict of interest statement is so vastly huge, so voluminous in the case of this paper here, that it is actually beyond amusing. It wasn't, oh, I just inexplicably forgot to do it. You made a decision to leave that out because it destroyed the argument you were trying to put forward. The argument you were trying to put forward was that low-density lipoproteins cause atherosclerosis, which they don't. You found one paper that is bought and paid for, thoroughly bought and paid for, that suggests that. It's an opinion piece and not an experimental piece of work whatsoever, in fact. And you painted it out as being proof of causality and you ignored the conflicts of interest statement when you've just dismissed two papers put forward by somebody else with two conflicts of interest. Two. This one has hundreds of them, Chris. You hypocrite. Is that very clear to people? I hope so. Let's move on. Claim about LDL cholesterol not being causal. I wrestled with that before releasing that episode. First it was in and then it was out. I was having two problems. The first is it was a very long list of authors and I wanted to treat them all fairly without making the episode a whole lot longer. Well, you can't. They've all put their names to that paper. And of the entire list, of authors in that paper, one of them stated no conflict of interest. One. The rest of those authors, there was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of conflicts of interest with pharmacological funding from companies that make statin medications who are buying the opinion statement of these self-claimed European Consensus Panel, self-named, it's just a group of researchers that decided to call themselves that, who have been paid millions and millions and millions of dollars to make a false claim in the science, in an opinion piece. And you've described it as evidence of causality. And then you've taken one or two of the graphs out of that chart and being completely, patently unable to actually critically analyze the empirical implications of those data sets. 
It's covered in my video, the original one. Go and have a look at it, boys and girls. Which, by the way, there's been an upward spike in the last few hours of views on that original video, precisely, I think, because people have watched your video, Chris, on your channel, and they want to go and see what I've said. Hopefully, they will learn something, and they will get to the understanding that you are a charlatan, an ideologue, a misanthrope, and actually criminally negligent. And uh, I'm sure I'll gain some more support subscribers out of it. Thanks for helping, Chris. You're doing God's work there. Uh, right, what's next? For example, the statin research Dr. Krauss referred to was funded by the NIH, and I didn't want to paint him unfairly with too broad a brush. The second is, I feel differently about food company funding than I do about pharma funding. Who cares, Chris, what you feel about funding sources? Any conflict of interest is a conflict of interest. Now, is millions of dollars of funding to a bunch of authors writing an opinion piece claiming that cholesterol is causal in heart disease, is that a conflict of interest if that source of funding is companies that make statin medications, Chris? Yes, it is. We're done. Aren't we? 99% of the time, food companies are not funding research to improve the health of a product. And the same is true of pharmacological companies, Chris. They are funding research to support claims that, number one, their products are valuable and important to people, and number two, to find out just how bad and dangerous and contraindicated their drugs are, to see what they can get away with pushing on an unsuspecting public and not. Pretty much. A drug company has a vested interest in the lack of health of individuals. Drug companies want and need people to be behooven to their products for a lifetime. That is what they promote, not health. Hello, have you ever been to reality, Chris? Wakey, wakey, smell the bakey. It's to sell more of it regardless of its health. Yeah, the same is true of drugs, pharmacological drugs. You scientifically illiterate propagandist buffoon. And Nestle has some great books about that. No, she doesn't. Pharma companies... That's an opinion, Chris, and it's an ignorant one. You're wrong. You can do that too, buyer beware, but oftentimes they're funding really good scientists. As they no, they're not. And who's to determine who is and who is not a really good scientist, Chris? You? No, son. You're not qualified to do that at all. How do I know that? Well, look at everyone you put forward as a good scientist, none of whom are. Okay? They have with Brian Ferentz to improve the drugs almost all of us end up depending on for... There you go, see? There you go. I'm not dependent on any drugs, Chris. Neither are the vast majority of people who undertake a nutritionally appropriate lifestyle for a human being and have done for let's say five years or more. Isn't that interesting? Some portions of our lives. And if you're a meat lover, you must appreciate the many billions that pharma funds universities each year. To yeah, not as much as drug companies spend though on things like the European Consensus Panel Position Statement, for example. Search the vaccines, antibiotics, and dewormers that keep meat abundant and cheap. Yeah, yeah none of this is relevant to anything, Chris. This is just noise. And if you're a pet lover, same thing. Shots, painkillers, dewormers, yada. They yeah, so money is not spent also by big agriculture interests on keeping plants viable and healthy enough to produce so-called food-like slop for humans. Again with the cherry picking, again with the half-assed information, Chris. Again with the propaganda. Again with the noise. Again with the failure to front me to my face to deal with these issues and litigate them empirically. Okay? They move science forward a lot more often than food companies do, and they need leading university researchers. Again, who's to decide who's a leading researcher? Not you, Chris. Clearly. And again, your opinion on who drives science forward more food-related funding or pharmacological related funding? That's your opinion, Chris.
you've supplied absolutely no underpinning evidence for that. In a discussion with you, I would give you an opportunity to provide it. I realize many of the statements that I make unequivocally on my channel are also not underpinned at that time by a peer-reviewed resource. Doesn't mean there isn't one, it just means that when you're making YouTube videos, or when I'm making YouTube videos, I am giving people an opportunity to think about things. I'm giving people an opportunity to do a search for themselves and see whether what I've said is actually underpinned empirically or whether it's not. I am being an educator, an entertainer. I'm not writing academic work for academic purpose, wherein you need to reference every statement. It's a different format. Uh, you may not have noticed. Okay, I'm inviting you to provide the empirical evidence for who drives science forward more, food industry funding or pharmacological industry funding, Chris. While you're at it, perhaps you could show me where the delineation between those sources of funding might be, because if you source the money and trace the money and see which companies own what companies and what connections there are between what companies, you might find there's very little difference, for example. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> So how is this relevant to anything? This is a picture of a dog sledding. While it may be amusing and joyful and lighthearted, it has nothing to do with the argument at hand, does it, Chris? It's a waste of time. Bart didn't mention that I made a glaring error with not disclosing funding, and I apologize. Good. It wasn't a glaring error, though, Chris. It was a decision made with malice of forethought, in the hope that you weren't going to get called up on it. You dismissed out of hand two sources put forward by another very well-respected professor, Tim Noakes, because of industry funding, and then you ignored a vastly, hugely voluminous list of industry funding to another paper that did suit your ideology, not five minutes later in the same video. You are done in this space. You're finished. You need to shut down your channel and withdraw. Or you need to front me for a discussion, after which you will need to shut down your channel and withdraw, because I will absolutely destroy you in a debate, Chris. Nina Teicholz is Dr. Noak's most referenced source and helped him with his legal problems. So? And she receives dark money to the tune of a million dollars a year. And how much money was behind that European consensus paper that you touted as being absolute proof of causality, even though it wasn't? Notwithstanding the industry funding, it was an opinion piece. It was not an experimental piece of work that can establish cause and effect. A competent scientist actually doing science knows that, Chris. From an Enron hedge fund billionaire in Texas to fund her lobbying on behalf of the beef industry. Yeah. And her PR campaigns to discredit nutrition scientists. I really am sorry I neglected. Nutrition scientists don't need discrediting by an external organization, Chris. They've done it for themselves over the years. There is nothing credible in the ring-fenced area of ideology known as nutrition science. Nothing at all. As regards hard health outcomes over any period of time in human beings for any aspect of human diet whatsoever, of any kind. We're done here on that. That. One important clarification is Bart frequently claimed that I said you should ignore studies with questionable funding. Because remember, Chris, I didn't say that you said one should. I said that's what you did. Because you did that. You said I didn't know who, those, who that author was. That Tim Noakes cited two papers from, you looked at the industry funding, you said, look at that, two sources of industry funding, we're done here, and you moved on to the next point. That's what you did. Conflict of interest is bad, and it's a reason to ignore everything they have to say and move on. What I actually said is those are yellow flags. Well, actually, I said, uh-oh. The New Zealand Dairy Board, uh-oh. Uh-oh. Yeah, but you didn't say uh-oh, uh-oh to the paper that agreed with your ideological standpoint, did you, Chris? Also, you made a decision not to let your viewers know that the paper that you wanted to use to support your ideology was vastly, grossly, hugely more compromised by the exact same industry funding problem that these two papers here were, 
vastly, hugely more so, obviously more so. I caught you out on it. It wasn't hard to do. Your credibility is now in the toilet, son, where it should be. Okay? New Zealand Dairy Board, industry funding invalidates science, says Chris. That's what he's implying here. But in the episode, I devoted a lot of minutes to those papers to go. No, you didn't. That's a lie. People can look at both my video critiquing Chris's original video, and you can look at Chris's original video if you like too, and you will see that he has just told you another lie. He did no such thing. He spent almost no time whatever on those papers. Through their claims, Bart corrected me on the seven country study led by Ansel Keys and referred to it as the 22 country study. The seven country study was only one of the many things that he. You mean the 22 country study? The 22 country study is actually this one. No, that's a completely different study that actually did call itself the 22 country study, Chris. You idiot. That's a completely different study. Ansel Keys cherry-picked his data from seven countries that suited his hypothesis and eliminated the rest of the countries that he did collect data from, from his data set. It was discovered in a basement on some magnetic tapes after his death. This is public knowledge, Chris. Everybody knows this. Okay, this is a completely different study, you buffoon. From Yerushalmi and Hillebo, published in 1957, a year before the seven country study began. The 22 country study was based on United Nations food data and published. And look at that the R squared value around any trend line that you could draw through that data set is so vastly wide as to make that data set completely without utility. You could draw any number of trend lines at all sorts of different gradients and y intercept values there and not particularly affect the value of R squared that you would get. Whoops. So, uh, you know, again, competent statistician is what's required to assess what a data set does and does not say can and cannot imply, Chris. And you're not that. Not remotely that. This fascinating chart showing the. It's not fascinating. It's a mess. There is nothing of utility there. There is an R squared value of so close to zero, probably, as makes no odds, actually, Chris. Look at the spread on that. Goodness me. Sharp rise in mortality that comes from eating. It shows no such thing, Chris. Nonsense. Or animal protein. All of the seven countries' data was from 16 areas among seven countries over 50 years, not 22 countries. Right, so that's about an R squared value of about point, just over 0.8. And so what? How many different degrees of freedom play into cardiovascular coronary heart disease deaths? Was smoking controlled? No. Exercise? No. Socioeconomic status? No. Education? No. Healthy user bias? Is that? taken care of by this study? No. This is an associative data set. It is incapable of informing on cause and effect at all, in any way, shape or form. Also, the difference between two per thousand person years and 16, 17, 17 per thousand person years would be 15 per thousand person years or 1.5 per hundred person years. Okay, not much. Utility? It's, it's, a, it's a pretty graph. It's an associative data set. It's a naturalistic observation without any observational control or scientific discipline of any kind. Okay, what's next? 
but it pretty much confirmed the chart in the year. And also that R squared value there takes the average value from each of those regions, which in and of itself also has an R squared value around its value or, a, or an, an error, not an R squared, an error around that. And that's not shown here. Because that, again, widens out that R squared again. It's a fallacy. This is smoke and mirrors, Chris. This is statistical noise. Literally, statistical noise. This is misdirect, okay? Chami and Hillebo paper and added the clarity that the added mortality was coming from saturated fat laden. It did no such thing. Chris, that is absolutely ridiculous. Fundamentally unscientific and unsupportable. This is an associative data set. It cannot inform on nor petition causality in any way, not under any circumstances. False, Chris. Meat, not fish. Bart made the point that that was associative data and you can't infer a cause from that. Correct, you cannot. You cannot inform on cause and effect using associative data. But he did make an exception for the smoking studies. No, I didn't. False. I did no such thing. That is a misrepresentation of what I said, Chris. I said the association between smoking and lung cancer, for example, reported in the literature, is vastly more powerful than anything you will find in any aspect of nutrition epidemiology anywhere in the literature. Vastly more powerful. And I said that because it is correct and it is underpinned by published empirical works of epidemiology. Okay? Because the association was so strong. The, no, no, no. That doesn't say anything about causality. The smoking data is still not causal data. It is still associative, which does not inform on causality. What it does do, though, is give us a comparative value of the strength of a correlation. And the smoking correlation with lung cancer is vastly stronger than anything in nutrition epidemiology, hugely. Incidence of, for example, lung cancer in smoking populations increases relatively by 11,500%. That is a figure derived from a paper that I have read on this topic, Chris. That's where that figure comes from. I didn't cite it here because I'm making a YouTube video. It's not, however, a number I just made up. Maybe front me for a debate and I'll provide that paper for you. Don't front me and you'll possibly have to go and find it for yourself because it does exist. Per pack year of smoking. That's really, really hard to ignore. That's right, but that doesn't mean causal. It means it's hard to ignore. Different. See how that's different? What's next? He didn't produce evidence for those numbers. No, you're quite right, I didn't. But tell you what, front me for a debate, son, and it will be on the table if you need it to be. How's that? The landmark studies on smoking were led by Richard Dahl of Oxford. So, that's the original work in the 50s. There you go, 1950. There's been no studies done since on the incidence between lung cancer and smoking since the 1950s, Chris? Hello? Wakey, wakey, smell the bakey. He was treated just like Ansel Keys was treated when Dr. Dole showed evidence that smoking was harmful. Well, he didn't actually show evidence that it was harmful because that's a cause and effect statement. He showed an association, a strong association. Ansel Keys did not show a strong association, and Ansel Keys cherry-picked his data precisely in order to show any kind of correlation at all. Quite a different thing. Since the work done by Dole in 1950s. There have been other authors who have contributed to this area, Chris. Maybe you should bring yourself up to speed on that. They corroborate what Richard Dole had to say in terms of incidence. And in fact, there's at least one paper that shows an 11,500% increase in lung cancer incidence in people per, per pack year of smoking. Okay? That's why I quoted that figure, because it exists. In 1950, when they published their results, it was um, received with apathy. 
anger and disbelief. Sure, most new things are. So well, clearly we had to approach it by some other method. And the obvious method was what we call, now call a cohort study and to try and see if we could predict who would get lung cancer. So we thought doctors would be a good population to study. The British doctors provided quite a nice natural experiment. No, they don't, because they do not represent society at large, Richard Pito. False. Some of them didn't smoke at all. Some of them started smoking cigarettes when they were young and kept on smoking cigarettes all their lives. And then when the results were published in the British Medical Journal, the doctors read the British Medical Journal and thought, my God, this is serious. This doesn't just kill patients, this kills doctors. And that is exactly analogous to where we are today, but for different topics. No, it isn't. That's not exactly analogous at all. That's an opinion statement, Chris, and it's vacuous. While doctors were influenced by medical journals, consumers were influenced by this. So, more propaganda from Chris. Advertising for cigarettes. Yes, we know advertising for cigarettes occurred. So what? Advertising occurs for all sorts of things, including contraindicated dangerous metabolic poisons in the guise of pharmaceutical drugs, Chris, for example. How about advertising for completely inappropriate non-food substances for humans and under the guise that those things are in fact food when they're not? How about that? Come to where the flavor is. Come to Marlboro country. And this. The media were, of course, against us for a long time. Well, of course they were, because there was money behind the cigarette companies. Duh. And whenever they announced a new observation on the harmful effects of smoking, it's likely it's not there. The man announced it would be smoking a cigarette. Who's ever heard that, that statins are safe and effective as a means to reduce the burden of heart disease? I wonder where that comes from. Was it, is that bought and paid for by companies that make those dangerous contraindicated poisons? Yes, it is. We've seen an example of it in the European Consensus Panel opinion piece paper, for example. Are there any other examples from recent events in society where we're told a certain thing is safe and effective when it's patently anything but either safe or effective, for example. Does that ever happen? What is your point, Chris? Or well, they would have someone else get up from the tobacco industry and say, well, it's controversial. Somebody else doesn't believe it. But the experts who dogged Richard Dole his whole life and weren't actually doing science didn't have the internet to amplify their claims. Dole's study of doctors, which, like the seven countries study, lasted 50 years, caused yeah. the U.S. Yeah. The original, one of the original papers, which showed something like an 11-fold change in incidence. Yeah. As Congress to ask him and his co-author, Richard Pito, to testify about the magnitude of the problem. And he was prepared. You should probably pronounce that surname a bit more carefully than that, I would say, Chris. Pito. Okay. To go to the United States of America and face the venom of tobacco lawyers, it wouldn't be a thing that anybody would want to do. And I saw Richard doing this in his 91st and 92nd year. But I think when Dole walked into a room, um, you sort of had to be on best behaviour. You certainly couldn't think in a woolly way in front of him. Because he actually did the studies, understood study design, and fully understood the data. Which you don't, Chris. Clearly, patently, you've shown that time and again. Every time you attempt to show or analyse any actual empirical inference of any kind, your, your ability to critically analyse what you're talking about and to correctly characterise it is absolutely destitute, Chris. Time and again. For their congressional testimony, they cited an American study that showed about an 11-fold increase in lung cancer deaths. That's right, one of those original works, yes. Among long-time smokers. Yes. Not the 11,500% number that Bart provided per pack year smoked. That's because you haven't read the right paper, Chris. The one that does cite that. The one that does espouse that. The fact that you haven't done your research and haven't found and read that paper, Chris, is your failing, not mine. It doesn't undercut me at all. As I say, front me for the debate and we can talk about it. The numbers that Dr. Dole provided were not very different from the one... Nobody but Dr. Dole has ever done any work on lung cancer and smoking incidents is what Chris is saying. You idiot. 
Hutchins, the scientists were reporting on Dr. Keyes' study, which was going on at the same time. When the study began, it showed the incidence of mortality from heart disease was almost tenfold between Finland, who ate a lot of meat and... Yeah, that's nothing. Dairy and Japan, who ate a lot of fish and vegetables. Right, so now you want to generalize as to the diets of an entire country. Very scientific. That was before. And also, you know, cherry picked. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Look at that. Missing out the, you know, other 15 countries that he collected data on that did not support the hypothesized least squares regression line that you're seeing there with the lovely sum there that says y equals bloody bloody blah, blah, blah. cherry-picked data chris this is a known fact this is not up for debate anymore the evidence was found in the man's basement after his death okay well the finnish government took keys's findings seriously and instituted programs like berries for dairies incentivizing farmers to convert their farms from dairy farms to berry farms in finland I did an episode about that with another giant in the field and a Keyes protege. So now you're making cause and effect statements again, Chris. Transformed Finland's health. That's a cause and effect statement. Do you have any evidence to support that claim? No. Fortunately, Richard Dahl lived long enough to see some of the world stop pushing back on his epidemiology. He and Richard Pito were both knighted by the Queen for their achievements. Those are the kind of scientists I advocate for and defend, and a big reason why I spend so much... Rather than scientists who actually do cause and effect work. Rather than scientists who actually do science. Because health-based epidemiology is hypothesis-generating pilot work, Chris. It's not science. Unfortunately, many of the aspects of human health we are unable to do experimental work on because of ethics, practicalities, finances, etc. As such, what we are left with are ring-fenced areas of bought and paid for ideology. And those are the sad facts. It's time and money doing plant chompers. Thank you, Tony. There was a lot of pushback on me from both commenters and Bart about claiming Dr. Noakes was retweeting conspiracy theorists. So yeah, you've seen, no, you, you called him a conspiracy theorist. Retweeting a theory, be it conspiracy theory or whatever kind of theory, doesn't make you yourself such a theorist. And also, the term conspiracy theorist has become, in recent times, more so than even previously, with malice of forethought, it has become a slur on someone's credibility. In actual fact, what it shows is a vast weakness and destitute of the person trying to undercut the other person to actually deal with any arguments that they put forward. Oh, you're just a conspiracy theorist. Well, look, it's not really a competition and we're not really keeping score, but I think the conspiracy theorists in recent years are up about 17 nil for a number, Chris. That's one I did make up. Can you tell the difference? Okay, right. So conspiracy theory, as soon as you say someone is a conspiracy theorist, what you're saying is that you are unable to assail their actual argument. You are, you are conceding defeat. And you are attempting to claim victory from that defeat by using a loaded terminology that is supposed to be a slur and is a slur and is meant as a slur. That's why you get the response you get when you say conspiracy theorist, because you are claiming to be scientifically competent and able to comment sensibly on the um, things that other people have said about various aspects, Chris, and you're not, clearly. All you're doing is making it absolutely clear and patent that you are an ideologue, a theologue, a card-carrying member of the Church of Anorexia Vegana, a misanthrope of the highest order, an arrogant sufferer of Dunning-Kruger, and a man completely out of his depth and out of his lane, whose entire video, which we've now just about got through, which is supposed to be is debunking my video, You've come up with absolutely 
Nothing. Have you some? Nothing at all. Get conspiracy theories, I don't know how many times in this in this little film of yours already, Chris. It provides you with no credibility whatsoever. What Fair enough. Let's look at some tweets and see if I was being too harsh. Here's Dr. Noakes retweeting Peter Clack, a long retired journalist from So What do you know about what Tim Noakes was trying to do there? Maybe he disagrees with Peter Clack and he's retweeting it as a look at this. How do you know he's not doing that, Chris? You don't. And even if he does agree with this bloke, maybe there's a reason for that. Maybe you'd like to deal with the actual arguments around carbon dioxide. Not a safe topic here on the YouTubes. You get demonetized for giving an opinion on carbon dioxide. That's not in line with the acceptable narrative. But maybe you'd like to you know, engage with that at some point. That'd be interesting. From Australia, Peter's view is that atmospheric CO2 is on a dangerous decline, and if it gets much lower, all life on Earth will end. His tweets get a lot of traction. Where does he get his belief from? Here's one of his sources, Lepidinus. I have no idea how to pronounce that. So because he's cited somebody called Lepidinus or something at least once, that's his source of information? All you're doing is trying to undercut somebody by mischaracterizing the totality of who they are, what they've said, and for what reason, on the basis of a couple of tweets. Chris, it's ridiculous. It's fundamentally ridiculous. And so are you, son. Says it all started with this German document in 1942 that they wrote in case they didn't win the war militarily. He also discusses with Hitler a new plan to unite Europe, not just under the conquering hammer of Blitzkrieg, but through a lasting political and economic union. See, this is the level that Chris is operating at. It's pathetic, isn't it, boys and girls? It's absolutely, fundamentally destitute in every way. What scientific evidence of any kind has Chris bought to debunk anything I have had to say about anything ever? None. He's given his opinion on what I said. And he's directed a whole bunch of traffic to my video. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Which the uh, Maybe I'll make another $10 this week off that video. Creaming it. What's his named Europäische Wirtschaftsgemeinschaft, or the European Economic Community. So I guess it's true that one man's conspiracy is another man's truth. To me, the idea that... It what the hell is that supposed to mean, Chris? That's just waffle. That's just noise, like basically everything that comes out of your ridiculous gob. A German economic document from 1942 is driving Earth scientists like me 80 years later is a conspiracy theory, but I guess, Tim Noakes, it's truth. My conspiracy... Again, the word guess there, Chris, that's exactly what you're doing. You're guessing. You have no idea what Tim Noakes' opinion is. Have you spoken to Tim Noakes about what his opinion might be? No? Okay. The theory is the coal industry found a retired journalist who had blogged about his financial struggles. So, right, so conflict of interest is bad, is it, Chris? Remember that? They pay him to write a constant stream of pro-coal tweets, same as Nina Teicholz does for beef. Yeah, and same as the European consensus panel on that paper that you based your entire argument around Tim Noakes not being credible on, Chris. Remember that? The actual one point that you can't get away from, the one point, it was actually the point, really, of that entire presentation, which absolutely eviscerated you, beyond repair. Okay? I get offers every week to promote health products on my channel for money, so the theory seems plausible. He claims the UN has led a destructive 30-year path based on a grotesque lie about the wonderful life-giving properties of carbon dioxide. Okay. That's somebody's opinion. That makes me and my professors grotesque liars since I started my duty. In somebody else's opinion, Chris, it might be an opinion that a number of people share, and it's an opinion that I know a number of people don't share as well. However, if we look for actual supporting science around either side of that particular argument, that's an interesting discussion, which is not safe to have here on the YouTubes.
geophysics career in the 70s. If only we had known about a journalist on a crime beat in Australia 50 years ago, we would have saved billions in scientific instruments and research. Last thing, some people called me out as a coward for turning down his invitation to debate him. Mm -hmm. I understand why it could look that way. Because you're a coward, Chris, that's why. Because you know that you will get absolutely smashed into the mat. What's left of your already eviscerated carcass, son? All of that is, uh, none of that is supposed to be literal, for God's sake. Settle down. This is all hypothetical. This is about a discussion around the science, which you cannot prevail in, Chris. You will not foot it in the ring with me in a, in a scientific discussion. Okay? That's why you're not doing it. It's your arrogance and Dunning-Kruger that won't allow you to actually engage with me. And probably, you know, your ego, because you know that as soon as you actually engage with me in a debate about this topic, I will absolutely wreck you, clown. But it's not something I can do, because I often include my grandkids in my episodes, and... So? They watch them. So? I have to stay family-friendly, and if you... I've already agreed, Chris, that should you front up to this discussion, it will be family-friendly. I will conduct myself entirely professionally throughout in order to subserve getting you to the table. Sure, my style on my other videos can be abrasive. I do that with Melissa Forthorpe for clicks. It works quite well. Um, when I find something that works better than that, I'll use a different technique. But until I do, this one works. It works well. I'll keep doing it. But to get you to the table for this debate, I have already undertaken with you in a message to you on Instagram this week, Chris, that we can have that discussion and it will be entirely professional. And your grandkids can watch it and learn what a charlatan their granddaddy is and how easy it was for an actual scientist to run rings around him. That's why you're not doing it, son. It's your ego. It's the problem here. Prove me wrong, front up. You have my contact details on Instagram. Send me a message, agree to it. We'll set it up. You can bring your references to the table and I'll bring mine and we'll see who's right and who's you. If you've watched any of Bart's debates and episodes, you know they're anything but that. Most of them, yeah. I hope you can understand. So what are- well, I've already covered that. We can do this in a manner that is family friendly so that your grandkids can watch it and learn everything they need to know about granddad. Are my conclusions from Bart's fiery episode? Actually, Chris, if you have watched any of my episodes, you'll see that the critique video I made on your Tim Noakes video was quite tame, actually, in comparison to most of my videos, as is this one again today precisely in order to show that I am more than capable of being quite professional and quite tame while ever being very, very strong about what is clearly patently the facts of the matter. And the facts of the matter are, son, you are completely destitute of competence to speak on human nutrition, and as such, you should stop doing it. I mean, I wouldn't mind if what you were saying was correct. There are many people with no credentials and no credibility of their own and no training and no expertise in this area talking about human nutrition who are saying the, the correct thing. I leave those people alone. The people I pick on are people like you, Chris, who are saying the wrong thing demonstrably. And then, you know, I, I call you out even in an area that you claim to be expert in, environmental science, and I make a perfectly correct statement, and you mischaracterize the statement and show data on a completely different question, for example. Land use versus land clearance. Because you are a coward and a charlatan and a misdirector of public attention. You're a propagandist. You're a spin doctor. You're an ideologue. And you are basically a criminally negligent misanthropist, Chris. You need to stop. But before you stop, you need to front up to me for the spanking that you deserve, which I will happily give to you scientifically in a debate on the topic, the moot of which we can decide more exactly when you've decided you're going to go ahead and do it, which is what you ought to do. Or have the good sense and the 
and, uh, and uh, good faith, I guess, to shut your channel down and stop your little hobby here. You've been called out. Front up or shut it down. Okay? Number one, I would have loved... Or your third option is to continue to promote my material. Yeah, I'm quite happy for you to promote my material to an audience who will learn something and probably have their mind changed about many things by watching my material. That'd be great too. To see evidence. Charts, diagrams, publications. Charts, diagrams, publications are not evidence, Chris. You have to actually competently, critically analyze an empirical inference to decide what qualifies as evidence or otherwise. That's where you fall flat on your stupid face, Chris. Every time you try and do it, as I've pointed out again in spades here in this yet again more than 90 minute video, which is the length it is precisely because I'm giving you the respect of playing your entire video so that no one can accuse me of selectively editing it. Okay. But I think what we saw was 96 minutes of expert opinion. And I think most scientists remember expert opinion. I think we covered that earlier in the video. Yes, my, my YouTube videos are expert opinion. If you want to litigate science, that's done empirically by way of a debate style discussion where we can bring references to the table and critically analyze those references, those inferences for veracity. That's how that's done, not in a, not in a YouTube video of this style. It's done in a discussion face-to-face, -face, Chris. Okay. I believe that expert opinion is the lowest tier of evidence. That's right. And what you've provided here in your video here is non-expert opinion. You've provided your opinion on my opinion on something that I am expert in and you're not. So if we're going to play that game, I win before we even start because I am an expert in human nutrition, human physiology, and human health, Chris, and you are not. I'm also an expert in statistical inference, pure and applied statistics and research methodology, and you clearly are not, Chris. Okay. Number two, any mention of conspiracy theories really fires up the comments section, and I know they can be used as dismissive insults. And that's what you did. That's what you did. That's why you got the response that you got, Chris. It was entirely appropriate and indicated that you get that response. But I felt in the Tim Noakes episode, I had to bring them up because the evidence is so strong that in Tim... You didn't provide any evidence, Chris, of anything in your video about Tim Noakes. Not at all. Not a scrap. Another misdirect. Tim Noakes' case, he's strongly influenced by them, and they're very... You have no idea what influences Tim Noakes, Chris, at all. Have you spoken to the man? Do you know Tim Noakes? Have you sat down and had a coffee with the man or whatever it is? and actually discussed it with him. No? That's what I thought. Very influential on the internet. And number three... Not just on the internet, he's a highly respected, well-published professor of multiple decades duration, Chris. The internet is a more recent thing. Tim Noakes has been around forever. Okay? Now I get to go back to the Lisa Moscone brain power episode. Yay! I finished her books and I love... Right, so vacuous, destitute, completely lacking in any form of refutation to anything I said in my video. Um, you were smashed, you were eviscerated, you were destroyed by me in my original response to your Tim Noakes slur, Chris. You've learned nothing from it. All you've done now is try to misdirect and save face. You've failed again in the most destitute fashion possible, I would suggest that it might be likely that you will get a number of messages in the upcoming days to remind you of your responsibilities to front up Christopher. I'll look forward to hearing from you. The rest of you, you know the drill. Don't let the door hit you in the backside on the way out, and we will enjoy the dulcet tones of Vivaldi on your way out of the room. Do clear up after yourselves, by the way. Don't leave mess in the room for the next class that come in. Right, Antonio Vivaldi, two, three, four. <laughs>